Okay, I get to be Sherry Ann today, so I will read the scripture. Um, Luke 8, 26 through 39. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he had stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no, no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles. And he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not, com that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. When those who fed them saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear, and he got into the boat and returned. Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed through the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. All right, good morning again. Man of the Gadarenes, or the Gerasenes. It's uh, translated both ways, so don't get hung up on that. It's a, a whole region on the, uh, on the shore of the Lake of Galilee, opposite Galilee. And it was a, a Roman region. It was called the Decapolis. There were 10 Roman uh, cities there. So uh, this is a really interesting story. And I've called this The Return of the Scapegoat, a literary reading of the Man of the Gadarenes. It's a story of a scapegoat. And uh, we've talked about scapegoating a bit here. And remember, in the Old Testament, the scapegoat was... Uh, was a, a process part of Yom Kippur, part of the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would lay his hands on the head of a goat, the, he would confess over and transfer the sin of the people onto this goat, and then they would drive the goat into the wilderness. Uh, it was ritualized and is repeated every, every year after that. So it, was, it became a ritual uh, practice of the Jewish people. Uh, other cultures didn't have a particular ritual practice of scapegoating, but we all know how to scapegoat. <laughs> we all know how, and cultures throughout history have uh, identified a person or a group, of, a group of people that they define themselves over and against, they, that they see as other, that they see as outsiders, and so we, scapegoating happens all the time. Uh, so even though in this story we're not in... Israel, we're on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, we're still encountering scapegoating in this story. Uh, so the story, in a nutshell, you just heard uh, a literal telling of it, is Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man. He, the man lives among the tombs. The town has chained him up, but he repeatedly breaks his chains, gets loose. He sits there and he bruises himself with stones. Uh, and Jesus comes to the man and he sends the demons from the man into a herd of pigs. The pigs hurl themselves down over a cliff into the Sea of Galilee. Then the townspeople are afraid and they ask Jesus to leave. <laughs> and the man who has been delivered wants to go with Jesus, but Jesus tells him, no, I want you to stay here uh, with your people. And he says, uh, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. 
So this is a literal telling of the story. And I think it's fine to understand the story this way, in a literal way. Uh, but a literal reading is not necessarily a literary reading. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today. So the difference between a literal and literary reading like this, as adjectives, the difference between literal and literary is that literal is exactly as stated, read or understood, without additional interpretation. We need to be able to speak literally. If I was building a house and I called out to my helper and said, cut me a two by four, uh, 48 and three quarter inches long, I wouldn't want him to back, call back and say, what do you mean by that? Or what is the deeper meaning behind that statement? No, I just need a two by four, cut 48 and three quarters inches long, right? But sometimes though, I mean, sometimes we have a really a, a good need for being literal. Other times being literal misses the point. Like when a guy says, when you might say, that guy knows the ropes. We don't mean that that guy knows a lot about rope, that he's not a, we don't mean that he's a rope expert. We mean that he knows what he's talking about in whatever the, the topic is that we're discussing. Or a statement like this, that threw me for a loop. It doesn't mean that we were tossed up upside down in the shape of a loop. It means that that, wow, that just really surprised me. That took me by surprise, right? So we have sayings like this that we know instinctively or we've learned to not take literally that we, we realize they mean something else behind the, the actual text. Uh, but we ask not only what does this story say, so when, we're, when we approach this story today, we read it literally, but we also can say what is this story saying behind the literal words? What is, does it have something more? So when we, when we approach a text in a literary way, we ask some questions of the text. Uh, for instance, we might ask, what is the meaning behind the text? Or who are the representative characters and symbols in the story? And even how does this story function? And this is one, this third piece is one that's been lacking, I think, in a lot of evangelical uh, study of the scriptures. How does this story function in its place in the canon? How does it function in its uh, place theologically, historically? Yeah, in the context of the, the people it's being written about, how does it function? So this story, I think, contains four important symbols. Uh, the first one is C. In all three of the synoptic uh, gospel accounts of this, this story appears contextually right after Jesus has calmed the, the sea in the Sea of Galilee. So if we look at it contextually, we can say the sea... Uh, might have something significant in this story. And, and also see throughout the scripture is a symbol or a sign for chaos or for the abyss. So even in the book of Revelation, we, we read that the new Jerusalem will have no sea. It doesn't mean there's no ocean there. It just means there's no chaos. In the, in the new Jerusalem, will, chaos will be done away with. Um, so the fact that this comes right after, in all three tellings of it, comes right after Jesus calming the sea might give us a clue that what was he doing? He was calming the sea, or in a literary sense, he was resolving chaos. He was doing something to take chaos out of this environment. Then he lands on the shore of uh, the Gadarenes and encounters some chaos. <laughs> so, Right, so the, the next symbol I think is important is a cliff or cliffs. The pigs in this story fall from a cliff. In the ancient Near East, cliffs were not just pretty sights, the, the scenic views and so forth. They were used uh, as uh, execution places. There's a place in Rome still called the, uh, the Tarpeian Rock in the city of Rome that dates back to pre-Christian uh, times that was used as an ex execution site. They would take people up there on that rock and cast them off uh, and they'd fall to their death. So some people say we shouldn't try to read scripture in a literary way, that we should just read it literally. We should just read the text and ask what does it mean on the surface of the text. Uh, they say how, and they justify this by saying how would we know, how could we know whether the, the writers intended for us to think of this in a literary way, or the, if they intended for us just to think of it uh, literally. So I have a, 
I have a thing that might help us uh, resolve that a little bit. In case you think uh, this is called literary criticism, when you approach the Bible as a piece of literature, you ask different questions of it than you would if you just took it literally. In Luke 4, so we're, this story we're reading today is in Luke 8. In Luke 4, we back up a little. There's a story we've talked about here before where Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue. They hand him the scroll. He ro unrolls a scroll to Isaiah, and he reads from it. And he preaches there to the, to the people, and he then follows up. Well, let me just read that passage. After he preached to them, it says, they, the people in the synagogue, got up and drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Now, we know today from archaeology and topography that the city or town of Nazareth was not actually built on a hill and didn't actually have a cliff there. There is a hill about two miles south of Nazareth, of the ancient biblical location of Nazareth. The, new, the current city, the modern city of Nazareth, is in a different location. There's a two, but it would have been a two-mile hike to take Jesus from the synagogue to the cliff to throw him off, which seems a little unlikely to me. And also, both Mark and Matthew's account of that story don't include anything about a cliff or about the people even wanting to kill Jesus. They, they simply say that the people uh, were offended by his words. That word, or they took offense, and that word in the Greek is, a, is the word we get uh, scandal from. They were scandalized by his words. So it wasn't just a simple offense. They were, they were really offended in a major way, scandalized by what he had been saying. What had Jesus been saying to them? Well, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he gives them two stories from the Old Testament, from their old scriptures, one about Elijah and one about Elisha, one where Elijah went outside the nation of Israel to heal a leper, a, a Gentile leper. Another story where Elisha goes and feeds a, an outsider a widow. So then after that, Luke says, the peoples uh, were so angry they took Jesus out to this, which we now know, a non-existent cliff in a non-existent city on a hill. <laughs> so how did cliff executions work? They worked like this. If somebody was going to be executed on the cliff, the community would gather around them sort of in a C-shape and walk them up to the cliff, all the while pointing at them, accusing them of whatever their, their crime was. And they would just continue to crowd and crowd and crowd that person closer to the cliff until the person eventually would fall off to their death. So what was the function of this kind of execution? It functioned like this. Since a whole, the whole community was involved this way, then nobody could be said to be individually responsible. But they, the whole community could be said to be responsible. So you had this dichotomous situation where since everybody took place in the, the execution, nobody was responsible. Yet they were all responsible as a community. So in other words, the mob acting as one became an executioner. And then this way the responsibility couldn't be laid at any one person's feet. Now this is the same dynamic that we see when Jesus says that famous phrase, let he who ha has no sin cast the first stone. What was he doing? He was interrupting that, that group dynamic and drawing attention to the first person that might throw a stone. Because if somebody could be singled out as the first person to throw the stone, responsibility for what happened after that could be laid to that one person. But in these, in these ancient times, they were careful to spread the responsibility around. So by importing a cliff into this story, I think Luke is doing something. He's bringing to mind collective executions. When he talks about this, he's, he's bringing to mind this, this picture that, which would have been common and understood, commonly understood there. And we see Luke has used a non-literal literary tool to do that. 
So here's another one, pigs. Pigs were unclean animals to Jews. They were uh, raised by others or outsiders. They, they were you know, not permitted to eat, eat pigs. Remember this story, now we're back to uh, Luke 8 with the, in, the, in the Gerasene region. This is a Roman region, so they uh, had pig herders. They were outsiders, others, they weren't Jewish. But actually, they were the very people that Jesus had told, talked about in Luke 4 that he was sent to. The same people that the people in his hometown tried to uh, dismiss him over. So, what, the reason I bring in Luke 4 and that whole story of the cliff in his hometown that didn't exist is to say that Luke gives us permission earlier in this, in this same book to look at this text non-literally, to look at it in a literary fashion. It actually says, maybe I missed it. It actually says, uh, they took them to the brow of the hill on which their town was built. Or they were so upset with Jesus because he was speaking against what they founded their town on. That their town was founded on the idea that these Gentiles are we should treat separately. We should see ourselves in, in uh, opposition to them. And when Jesus comes and he gives them two stories out of their own scriptures <laughs> that, that mitigate or come against that idea, uh, they, they, they became very angry and offended and, and uh, scandalized by it. So the fourth, the fourth uh, symbol we can pay attention to is stones. The demon-possessed man is said to have been bruising himself with stones. And this is where we'll and, and stonings were, ex were another form of uh, a collective execution, just like the cliffs were. You know, so we have two of these, these symbols, the cliff and the stones, which both functioned as community methods of executing uh, someone. And we'll get into the story now from there. So it begins like a classical scapegoat story. Here's the town scapegoat, this demoniac. He's a man who lives on the outskirts of, outskirts of town. He's like the town drunk. Uh, the town I grew up in, Dover, a little north of here, had a guy like this in our town. He drank a lot. He had a bit of a mental handicap, and he walked with a limp. And all of us school kids made fun of him. But why did we make fun of him? Because we learned to make fun of him from our older brothers and sisters and from our parents who made fun of him. He was, so the whole town could see itself uh, in opposition to this guy. So this is how this guy functions. He was the guy that we all ridiculed. Um, but we learned it from other people in our community. In Mark's account of this story, it says, Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. Or night and day he was tormented by his demons. Uh, he doesn't live in the town, but he lives just outside, just on the outskirts of town. So the people hadn't driven him completely away. He was handy. He was nearby. You, you, they chained him up, actually. But he breaks free from the chains over and over again. So if they had really wanted to get rid of him, they could have executed him. But instead, they have this funny dance going on, this odd thing that goes back and forth. They chain him, he breaks free. They chain him up again, he breaks free again. And this is odd dance that happens. And Luke says it's actually gone on for a long time. And Luke then says something else that's really important. He says this, For many times it, the demons, had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. So these chains and shackles that they put on him, you might think, was to keep the townspeople safe from this demoniac. But here it doesn't say that. It says if, when he did break free... He ran away into the wilderness. He didn't run into the town to, uh, to attack people. He ran out into the wilderness. So the demon-possessed man wasn't being kept in chains to protect the community. When he broke free, he didn't attack anybody in the community. He ran off. So why were they keeping him under guard and in chains? It wasn't because he was a danger to the community. I think it was because the community needed him, like we need the town drunk like we need somebody that we can define ourselves in opposition to. Communities need people like this 
to define themselves. Uh, they need people to define their own goodness and righteousness in opposition to the other person's sinfulness. We need the town drunk, the lunatic, to feel better about ourselves. But when, when this demoniac sees Jesus coming, he has this strange reaction. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So this demoniac runs to Jesus, bows down before him, and makes a spontaneous confession of the divinity of Jesus. He saw something in Jesus that, that his community certainly hadn't, hadn't seen. And even as we read the rest of the story, they never kind of see it. If only Jesus had received this kind of reception in his hometown. <laughs> but this is not the kind of reception he got in his hometown. It's, sometimes it is scapegoats like this guy who most clearly see who Jesus is. They might not completely understand him yet. He's saying, don't torment me. But people on the margins often see Jesus more clearly than us insiders do. James Allison has a phrase for it. He calls it the intelligence of the victim. The intelligence of the victim. And this man is demonstrating it in this story. He saw Jesus and recognized that he was actually divine, that he was the son of God, which even the people in, G in Jesus' own hometown couldn't see. He had a sort of intelligence that other people uh, didn't have. And Jesus asked him his name. What is your name? He replied, my name is Legion. For we are many. My name is Legion, for we are many. This is a strange sentence. It, there's a transition from a singular to a plural in the same sentence. You see that? I italicized the word my and then we. Or you might say, this legion is a population of many speaking with one voice. It's a group, in this case a group of demons speaking through this one, th with this one voice. It's uh, a collective then is inhabiting this man, but this collective is unanimous in its identity. It's a mob, a crowd of voices, and they're all speaking the same thing. Even the name Legion is an allusion to a Roman garrison of soldiers all marching in lockstep with one another. But where are these voices, these demonic voices coming from? Remember, we're, we're reading this in a literary way today, not a literal way, right? So I'm going to make a proposition. I'm going to propose that these demonic voices are in fact the collective accusations of his community. They're what the community has told him about himself that is tormenting him and that he's come to accept and believe. He's accepted the community's opinion of himself as lesser than them, as vile or maybe even cursed. He may have been in some way different than the community. Often scapegoats or the people or the groups that we scapegoat, there's something a little different about them, a little off from what we consider to be normal. He might have been mentally hand handicapped. I don't know, but the fact that toward the end it says that he was found clothed and in his right mind gives us a hint that perhaps he had some kind of a mental, mental condition. So I'm going to propose that the voices that he's hearing, these demonic voices, are the voices that he's heard for years from his community, telling him what's wrong with him, mocking him, uh, accusing him, just like we used to do with the town drunk in my hometown. All these distinct voices, though, have merged into one voice, the voice of Legion, and this man has stopped fighting back. He's given up. He's accepted their judgment on him. And he's begun, actually, to execute sentence on himself. He begins to stone himself. When it says he bruises himself with stones, what is he doing? He's, he's acting out what he believes his sentence should be from the community because he's come to accept what they say about him. Today, we might see it like this, a cutting disorder or self-harming, or self-mutilation. People cut themselves when they get to this place today. When people become convinced of their own worthlessness, and they accept the judgments of others 
they begin carrying out on themselves the sentence that they believe they deserve. We find all kinds of different ways to harm ourselves. But in this story, the, the man has accepted and internalized the judgment of his community and stoning was the customary punishment. So he's just acting out that on himself. His actions are mimetic, if you will. He is given in to this voice of the lynch mob and begins imitating itself, Im- imitating it toward him, his own being. You guys still with me? Yep. All right. Let me read you what James Warren writes about this. Possessed by the town's attitude towards him and the violent, abusive voices he has heard, he pathologically bruises himself with stones, doing unto himself before others can do unto him. To mitigate the pain of the group ostracism and expulsion, he agrees with his tormentor's opinion of him, symbolically acting out their violence through self-infliction of wounds. So then the legion makes a request of Jesus. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. What is the abyss? It's chaos. It's the sea that we just saw just prior to this. It's the sea that we're going to see a little bit later in the story. These demons are asking him, asking Jesus, not to put us back in a state of chaos. If Jesus heals their scapegoat, how will they be able to define themselves? How will they know who they are if their scapegoat is healed? If the town drunk is no longer the town drunk, how do they define themselves as good and him as bad? We need our town demoniac to know that we're okay sometimes. Then sensing their demise, Legion makes a request of Jesus. There on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. So Jesus says, okay, go ahead, go into the pigs, and there they go. I like that one second down, his eyes are really big and bugging out. The pigs go into the abyss. They fall into the sea of chaos. When this man recognizes Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, the other voices no longer have any power over him. Remember, he recognized who Jesus was when he came. When we see Jesus for who he truly is, we start to see ourselves for who we truly are. We get our our perspective in line. We begin to separate the voice of the accuser from the voice of God when we start to see Jesus for who he is. We can start to then discern uh, between these voices, which voices are demonic and which voices are divine. Even though this man had accepted and internalized his community's judgments against him when he saw Jesus, nothing could stop the exodus of all the impure demonic thoughts that had held him captive for who knows how long. Note that Jesus didn't have to order the demons to leave. He just gave them permission. They were ready to go. (laughs) He just said, I give you permission. Why? Because when we understand who we are in the light of Jesus, there are no hooks left in us for accusations, false accusations to hang on to. The voice of the accuser can't coexist with the voice of God then. So then the herders, the swine herders, go and tell the community what's happened. Then the people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid. It's funny, because in story after story, you know, when Jesus is going about doing things like this, fear is not one of the things we see happening. People are usually full of gratitude. Uh, They're astounded. They're astonished. Usually they want to follow him. Uh, Usually he has to break away somehow to sneak off and get time alone. But in this case, it's different. Now they're afraid. And even more than this. Whoops. Back up. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave, for they were seized seized with great fear. I've often heard preachers claim that, that they wanted Jesus to leave for economic reasons because 2,000 of their pigs just died. And this was a, a big economic cost to them. But I think if, they had, if that was the reason, they would have been angry, not afraid. 
But they, it says they were clearly seized with great fear. I think something else is going on. We've heard this voice before in this story. The voice of many speaking as one. Right? Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. This is the same voice we heard when Jesus asked the man, who are you? And he says, I, uh, I am, my name is Legion, for we are many. This is that same voice, all the people speaking with one voice in fear, asking Jesus to leave. Why? Because the community had just lost the center around which they defined themselves. They lost the ability to see themselves better than the man in the tombs. And if you can't define yourself over against somebody, you're likely to be afraid. Because how, does, how do you define yourself now? And then finally, the healed man wants to go with Jesus. Who would like to go with Jesus? If this was you, I'd like to go with him too. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And Mark, I think, adds, and how much mercy he has shown you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. They were afraid because they'd lost their town drunk, their fool, their demoniac. They had kept him in chains for their own edification. And from their position, I think they would rather have had the guy leave too. Because he would be a reminder, every day he was in their midst, he'd be a reminder of how they defined themselves. But Jesus doesn't let him go with him. He tells him to go back to his home. That means that he had been a member of this community. He had a home in the community that he'd been ostracized away from. But, so he wasn't a stranger to the people. They knew him. And it was likely all of their accusations, their false accusations against him, that drove him to the place he was. But now that he's healed, and he's not that person anymore, they are in a conundrum. And Jesus tells him to, the, to return. So that's why I call this the return of the scapegoat. This is the gospel. This is what Jesus asks us to do. Not to leave, pack up, and get out of Dodge when we're set free. He asks us to go back. He says, return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. This is an unsettling, subversive, this is the unsettling, subversive power of the gospel. This is actually the new organizing principle around which we should find our, define ourselves. Rather than defining ourselves in opposition to those we see as outsiders, those we see as less than us, as other, Jesus is giving us a new way to form our communities around the return of the scapegoat, not the exclusion of the scapegoat. It's, a, it's an important story. James Warren again writes this, and I'll close with this. A herd of pigs charging over a cliff and falling into the sea. The same thing that had happened countless times in the ancient world to countless victims of mob violence. The real excitement of Jesus' miracle, therefore, is that for the first time in history, it is the crowd, the mob, that is cast over the cliff while the scapegoat goes free. Rather than the scapegoat being cast out of the city, the city is cast out of the scapegoat, who now sits there clothed and in his right mind. The man who had had the legion, who had been the victim of the crowd, is restored and healed while the mob has unraveled becoming a trampling chaos that undid itself by the force of its own violence.